the campus of Yale University. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. One of the leading financial journalists who's written the definitive account of the fall of Bear Stearns, pierced the secrecy of money and power around Goldman Sachs, and now in an era of populist disdain for Wall Street, comes to the street's defense. Why we need Wall Street today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. William D. Cohen is former senior Wall Street M&A investment banker for 17 years at Lazard, Merrill, and J.P. Morgan. Old friend of the show, we had him on for the price of silence, the Duke lacrosse scandal, money and power, how Goldman Sachs came to rule the world, House of Cards, a tale of hubris and wretched excess on Wall Street. That was about the fall of Bear Stearns. And the last tycoons, the secret history of Lazard Frere, correspondent at Vanity Fair. And the book, Why Wall Street Matters. Welcome back, Bill. How are you? I'm great to be here. You know, I've kind of viewed you as a contrarian, and uh, you, you, would, you would bang on Wall Street when they needed to be banged on. And now we're in this populism era, and you're defending Wall Street. Uh, Why did you do this? Well, wouldn't that make me a contrarian, I guess? Yeah, it does make you contrarian. Right. I think it's right. great. It's lying with what you think. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, an, an, an odd turn of events. I do agree, and I, and I don't necessarily like to be put in the position of, you know, dis- defending the street uh, uh, or, or, or the behavior on the street. But I think we, we're we getting into a, a period of time where, you know, bashing Wall Street just became standard practice. And uh, there was a catalyst. Uh, I, I'm sure you remember this incident because you are, watched the Wall Street carefully when uh, uh, a guy who I know, uh, who I used to work with at Lazard named Antonio Weiss, was, uh, nominated uh, by President Obama to be an undersecretary uh, of the Treasury. Um, that means he had been vetted. That means he had been closely examined. That means he, had, you know, it wasn't just like a name that was being floated, a trial balloon. He had actually been vetted and and proposed by uh, President Obama to be undersecretary. He he uh, has uh, in sort of impeccable progressive uh, credentials. Uh, very knowledgeable about the street was. Uh, head of investment banking at at uh, Lazard was probably making a lot of money and was willing to give that up to go into the government to be under Secretary of the Treasury and um, Elizabeth Warren uh, just because he happened to work uh, on Wall Street just because he happened to be at Lazard uh, uh, would not even meet with him would not even meet with him to uh, uh, figure out whether or not this is somebody who she could support the nomination of. And at that time, a few years ago, she had the kind of uh, a, a power that the fact that she wouldn't even meet with him was enough to sort of doom his nomination. And so uh, uh, she wouldn't meet with him, uh, and he ended up uh, uh, withdrawing his nomination. Obama withdrew the nomination. So this is the, this is, uh, the sitting president of her own party had nominated him, somebody with impeccable progressive credentials to be under Secretary of the Treasury. She wouldn't meet with him, and he withdrew his nomination, and I thought, this is, this is insanity. Just because he worked on Wall Street, he couldn't be in government uh, because Elizabeth Warren said so. I thought that was beyond outrageous. Which, which is, uh, leads me to ask a point I was going to uh, go to because it flows right into it, which is I was looking at this, and uh, Trump is appointed from Goldman Sachs, Steve Mnuchin, Treasury, <laughs> Yeah. Um, Gary Cohn, the National Economic Con- uh, Council, Steve Bannon, the Chief Strategist, Jay Clayton, SEC Chair, Jim Donovan, number two at Treasury, and Dina Powell at the NSC. Is there anything wrong with that? Uh, so, th- you, know, you know, let's move to the other extreme now. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, literally, you know, right after the election. By the way, Trump had bashed Wall Street continuously. Not only that, Bill, uh, Goldman wouldn't even do business with him. As I had written in an Atlantic yeah. article, uh, Goldman wouldn't even do business with him and, you know, use Trump as sort of uh, a poster child of somebody they wouldn't do business with. I mean, way, if you want to know who not to do business with when you're at Goldman Sachs, Donald Trump is who that is. And uh, uh, then, you know, turn around and he's appointing all these people. So, is there anything wrong with that? Um, well, I think it's probably a bit excessive in Donald Trump's case because most of what he does seems a bit excessive to me. 
But uh, uh, no, in theory, there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody has the skills and somebody, uh, by the way, wants to give up uh, a very lucrative uh, career in the private sector uh, to serve uh, their nation, uh, his or her nation, in Washington, uh, uh, in the public sector, uh, and can get through a Senate confirmation hearing, by the way, uh, then, you know, why not? We need, uh, you know... The best minds that we uh, can can have uh, to uh, uh, help us run a very complex government, and especially you know in in uh, the uh, you know capital markets and finance, uh, you know having people at Treasury uh, who understand the way Wall Street works is I think pretty important. I mean I think we would all uh, agree, uh, or most people would agree, that the fact that Hank Paulson was Treasury Secretary during the financial crisis uh, was a positive. Uh, it's a huge positive. When you consider the other guys Bush had in there were really had no idea what they're doing. I also want to say in Goldman's exactly. defense, a lot of these guys came up as middle-class folks at best, um, um, and they really do have this you know, desire, this all-American desire to go and take that and put it into public service. And it gets twisted around as all oh, they're just going to go do Goldman's business, you know. Right. I mean, uh, uh, Goldman. You know, I wrote a book about Goldman. Uh, uh, Goldman has a very unique culture and and um, basically only hires, uh, uh, you know, mostly just hires people uh, who are uh, hungry uh, and ambitious, middle class, uh, you know, looking to change their you know economic their family's economic uh, status. Uh, you know, of course, in the case of Steve Mnuchin, his father, Robert Mnuchin, was a famous yep. uh, uh, longtime Goldman Sachs partner, and so he, he came from a, a wealthy family by that point. So that was an example of uh, a rare example, I think, especially in Goldman's case, of nepotism uh, or, or something like nepotism. Uh, you know, at Lazard, where I worked for a while, um, nepotism was much more common and hiring the children of rich and famous uh, people was much more common. But at Goldman, I think they have a different uh, standard. Let's talk about some of the reasons why Wall Street is, is so so hated. W- one of them is, is this divergence of fortune that appears to people, that Wall Street's no longer connected to Main Street and the 1% deal, uh, that gains are privatized, losses are socialized through bailouts. What, what are your thoughts along those lines? Well, I, th- I think that's exactly right. I think uh, Wall Street... Uh, does itself no favors uh, in its own uh, public relations, in its own behavior, uh, in its uh, failure to, uh, frankly, uh, you know, admit uh, uh, and come to grips with its own uh, failings and, and wrongdoings. I mean, uh, I think, you know, look, unfortunately, I'm old enough now to remember uh, various cycles of, of the way people viewed Wall Street. Um, you know, in the 80s, uh, and you'll remember this in the 1980s. So, you know, Wall Street uh, uh, bankers and traders uh, were rock stars. I mean, yeah. they were literally on the front page of the Wall Street Journal doing deals, and everybody, you know, so many people wanted to be uh, to go to Wall Street. I mean, you know, I in my own life, I sort of, uh, uh, along with uh, most everybody else I went to business school with, were sort of sucked into that vortex uh, of excitement around Wall Street and people wanted to work on Wall Street. Um, uh, And uh, uh, then uh, various crises occurred, you know, in in the stock market crash in 87 didn't help things. Uh, There's the credit crunch in the early uh, 1990s that didn't help things. Uh, The Internet, uh, uh, then again, uh, you know, everybody wanted to go to Wall Street again in the late 90s. And uh, there was uh, the Internet bubble crash uh, in 99, 2000, 2001, more trouble. And so these things go in cycles, but, you know, come 2006, 2007, 2008, Wall Street was misbehaving again, and the financial crisis of 2008 once again tarnished Wall Street's uh, reputation. And uh, I think the combination of sort of exacerbating financial crises uh, and uh, uh, not being held accountable for the wrongdoing uh, that occurred uh, in 2008, I think, really tarnished uh, Wall Street. We got we got about a minute to go. I want to ask you. You raise this, I think, a good point, which is a trust issue. That Wall Street is so opaque when it's, it's credit default swaps, dark pools, etc. How about that issue? 
Yes, well, I mean, the, again, they do themselves no favors. People don't understand what the heck is going on on Wall Street. <laughs> it, it seems like a, ba- a black box, a mystery. And, you know, when people uh, don't understand what's going on and people are making all this, mu- this money from the mystery, and then politicians like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton exploit that, well, then you've got a combustible mix. This is Talk with Jim Campbell on the BizTalk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com, find the station closest to you, or listen over the Internet, access our podcast. We'll continue talking with Bill Corn more on why we need Wall Street. And we're back with leading financial journalist Bill Cohen. Uh, I want to throw this by you. I interviewed Dave Stockman, and uh, this kind of blew me away, but he said that we should have let Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs go down, that uh, along with Baron Lehman, it wouldn't have mattered, a whip disappeared. What do you think about that? Well, uh, you know, David is somebody I've uh, come to admire uh, greatly. Yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, and, and uh, brilliant. And I never would have thought I would say that as, 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 since he was, you know, Reagan's budget director yeah. uh and uh but over the years he's you know he and i have come to think uh, a lot alike and um you know look i, I wrote uh this book uh, house of cards about the fall of bear stearns and uh you know the, as i wrote it and the more i thought about it i think the the exact right thing would have been to just let bear stearns fail and not to have rescued bear stearns i mean i understand why uh, Paulson and Bernanke uh, 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 did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, I think they thought that if we, by the way, when they rescued Bear Stearns, uh, uh, it was the first time in the history of the United States that the government had stepped in to save an investment bank. All the other times, and there have been many, many, many other times yeah. uh, when one had failed, they they let it go, and they didn't save it. And so this was the first time they decided to save it, and it was. You know, the reason was it was too interconnected to fail, uh, and they thought if they will, if we save Bear Stearns, then, you know, the rest of the tsunami will be, uh, you know, will be somehow ameliorated. And uh, unfortunately, uh, so I understand the logic at the time, and it seemed to make perfect sense, and they, you know, did it in a, in a way that uh, would be sort of hard, you know, we could debate whether they did it in the right way, but... Uh, 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 they did it, and then, of course, they did not stop the tsunami uh, because it was much bigger than just Bear Stearns, as we all came to realize. But uh, I think they, had they let Bear Stearns fall and fail and, and be liquidated, because that's what would have happened, then uh, Dick Fold would have gotten a very, very different message than he got. Uh, and, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs would have realized that, you know, the end was near. Merrill Lynch would have realized you know, and and Stan O'Neill would have realized it in Merrill Lynch, and so I think you you would have had a very different series of reactions to the failure of Bear Stearns than you than to the rescue of Bear Stearns. So D- Dick Fold would have been holding out for for hope that he would be rescued too. He would have you know sold himself, sold Lehman to whoever the Koreans, the Chinese, yeah. whoever much earlier than he held out than holding out for being rescued. Um, so I agree with him. Interesting. The, um, there were two hundred uh, billion dollars in fines that have been doled out for the mortgage crisis. I hadn't realized it was that high until I saw the number in your book. Does that, but the, the fact that nobody went to jail, you know, continues to bother people. Um, are those and fines right, enough? Are those fines enough, or, sh- or should somebody have gone to jail? Well, you know, when people, you know, do something wrong, uh, and it's and, and there's evidence of wrongdoing, it's the job of the Justice Department. Uh, and or the Securities Exchange Commission to hold the people on Wall Street accountable for what they did wrong. That's what's happened, you know, after uh, after the great, you know, night, the stock market crash of 1929. It's it what happened uh, throughout uh, Wall Street history. People have been let off in, in handcuffs, and not just for insider trading, but for actual wrongdoing related to uh, uh, financial crises. Uh, it's what happened in the savings and loan crisis in the late. 80s. I mean, hundreds, if not thousands. I've seen estimates of people were incarcerated uh, bankers as a result of what went wrong there. I mean, this was a, obviously a much bigger financial crisis than uh, the savings and loan crisis. And who, what happened? We had nobody uh, 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 held accountable. There was one trader at first 
Boston, who was uh, convicted of um, you know manipulating the value of his bond portfolio so he could get a bigger bonus, but that was sort of after the fact. Yeah. All the people who uh, had uh, packaged up uh, yeah. of mortgages that were never going to be paid back uh, were not held accountable. Except Fabulous Fab. <laughs> Well, a fa- fabulous Fab, of course, uh, was uh, low-level foot soldier. I low, think low, low-level it. foot soldier, Goldman, uh, who you know, and that was a civil uh, a case. I'm talking about criminal cases. They tried yes. one, the yeah. Bear Stearns hedge fund managers. They lost it, lost and it. that was it. They lost their verve. They lost their nerve. Um, Senator uh, Elizabeth Ward and Bernie Sanders, and unintended consequences. They want to. They want Glass Steagall back in. They want to break up the banks, et cetera. Uh, do they understand Wall Street, and uh, how, how dangerous would those acts be? Well, I just think they would be uh, uh, sort of a needlessly complicated and foolish uh, waste of time, um, sort of along the lines of stress tests and living wills that they now ha- have to face, with, face uh, uh, to co- spend billions of dollars to, to comply with uh, every year. Um, you know, look, when uh, the first legislation, the original Glass-Steagall, was uh, 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 brought up and approved uh, and, and implemented uh, in the 1930s, uh, it was three pages of a 35-page long uh, bill slash law, uh, what we call the Glass-Steagall Act. You had a year to celebrate, se- separate commercial banking from investment banking. This was a time when uh, the firms were uh, obviously much smaller. They were small private partnerships. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, very, only one firm uh, basically uh, found itself in a position where it had to decide between investment banking and commercial banking, and that was the old J.P. Morgan and Company, mm-hmm. and, and, and Morgan Stanley split off from J.P. Morgan and, and Company and became an investment bank, and J.P. Morgan stayed as a commercial bank. Now, you know, all these years later, uh, you know, these firms are much bigger. Unscrambling the egg uh, is much more difficult. Uh, and to what end? I mean, uh, you know, our, the, client, the reason that these firms are, uh, one of the reasons these firms are so big uh, and have so much capital and do so many things is because that's what their clients want. And, and Wall Street, uh, believe it or not, even though we've been uh, uh, indoctrinated to hate Wall Street uh, by politicians like Bernie Sanders and, and Elizabeth Warren, and, and not only them, but Donald Trump and others too, uh, we've been indoctrinated to hate them. Uh, and uh, uh, what in fact what they do is that they really uh, are just that big and do the things that their clients want them to do, and uh, they are the envy of the world. I mean, uh, our banking system, you know, like it or not, is literally the envy of the world as world leaders, and has been for some time. And that's what we want to destroy. That's what we want to break up. It's a, a national treasure. It's a national asset. And you know, frankly, we should be celebrating what it does right. And we should be fixing what it does wrong. And, you know, uh, by just saying let's reinstate Glass-Steagall, that just shows a level of naivete and political opportunism that, again, is, is, is a Elizabeth Warren uh, hallmark. What, what I find scary, uh, unintended consequences, they're turning the banks into kind of utilities, right? Well, I, I think that's where we were headed. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in my book, uh, you know, a Fed governor named Dan, Daniel Torillo, uh, who has, uh, was appointed by o- Obama uh, and really took it upon himself to turn the banks into utilities. Uh, nobody really knows who Dan Torillo is. I'd never heard of him. Yeah, he, he's sort of operating uh, stealthily. Uh, he'd be great to have on your show. He just announced his uh, resignation uh, after uh, Trump was elected, so I mean, I think that's a step in the right direction. Uh, uh, but he has single-handedly tried to turn the banks into utilities. Big mistake. Listen to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. We'll talk about the root of the problems on Wall Street coming right up with Bill Cohen.
We're back with Bill Cohen. He's written the book, Why Wall Street Matters. And we're going to get to what he thinks is the root of the real problems in just a second. But I want to stay on this um, unintended consequences, trying to turn banks into utilities. I want to get your opinion on some of this Dodd-Frank stuff and how much should be uh, torn up. Let me throw this stuff out at you. The Volcker Rule. Uh, I mean, political, politically motivated, meaningless, uh, you know, barring banks from proprietary trading, which is one of the things it does, is ridiculous. That's one of the reasons Goldman Sachs was able to avoid a lot of the problems that other banks had is because of its proprietary trading in 2006 and 2007 that saves the bank. Meaningless, stupid. Okay. Um, on SIFI, the systemically important financial institutions uh, take a big uh, byproduct. GE actually ended up feeling they had to divest their entire financial side of their business, which was over half. Uh, is SIFI a good idea? Well, look, as somebody who started at GE Capital uh, <laughs> and knows uh, you know, uh, 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 the important role that GE Capital played. Now, maybe GE, you know, if GE shouldn't have its own finance arm. Maybe that's the right business strategy, business decision, and obviously Jeff Ilmel thought that it was. Right. But, I mean, you know, ridiculous as well. I mean, look, we should get rid of too big to fail. If you know, I agree with David Stockman. If a firm gets itself into trouble, that's it. Let the market decide. Every other industry uh, has a bankruptcy procedure. Well, Wall Street should, too. Now, you're critical of the living wills uh, and the stress tests, but the, this, uh, if there's another crisis, um, how do people feel comfortable that, that a Citibank, for instance, which does seem to every 20 years get itself in almost out of business, that they can unwind themselves in a systemically or orderly way? They can't. It's they a can't. myth. Oh, pl- you know, please. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea that you were going to, what, when, when, when uh, things start hitting the fan, you're going to what dust off this you know 2000 page document called the living will and go through it page by page and, <laughs> and see if it tells us what we should do that's ridiculous uh, uh you know nobody's just going to sort of sit around and look at that kind of a document when when the crisis starts and as a crisis unfolds you have to be dealing with it in real time and and just because it says something on a piece of paper that's hardly the way it's going to go down in real life so again bureaucratic waste of time uh, people take comfort from something that has no meaning and it's extremely expensive to do just just ridiculous uh, all right how about this one now the the, the crisis obviously the uh, particularly the credit to false swaps are so much more interrelated than people realized that no one on wall street was was looking at systemic risk um from a sort of a global concern of the FISOC, the financial stability oversight council is supposed to do that is there a role for somebody to be looking at f- systemic risk from the top so we went from sort of uh, light touch regulation where there was no one, no regulators, no one from the SEC or the Fed inside these banks to a situation now where, you know, these banks are literally yeah. almost overrun by people from the Fed and the SEC looking over everything they do. Again, one extreme to the other. There has to be sort of medium uh, uh, regulation, some sort of oversight, uh, but this, this idea that you're going to be able to, you know, uh, you know calmly unwind a huge you know, bank during a financial crisis is ridiculous. Much better, as I'm sure we will get to talk about, is changing the compensation system, changing the incentive system on Wall Street so that people have the right incentives to do the right things or to avoid the wrong things. Exactly, and we are about to jump to that. One last thing. So far we've torn up Todd Frank. <laughs> oh, pretty, and deservedly so. <laughs> but what about um, the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau? We just looked into that, and that also has not really evolved the way it should have. But And it's also been captured by um, young liberal Democrats who don't understand business at all. But what do you think about the CFPB? Okay, so we're now talking about Elizabeth Warren's baby. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, actually if she had been running it, maybe we would be hearing less less of her instead of more of her. Mm. Uh, uh, I think in practice, you know, in theory, it's not a bad idea. I mean, you know, consumers should be protected. Uh, there should be someone to protect consumers from bad actors. But, you know, how about, you know, consumers you know, taking responsibility for their own actions, Uh You know, I would never sign uh, up for a mortgage uh, without carefully reading, you know, what interest I was paying and the payment schedule. I also wouldn't uh, sign a mortgage uh, knowing that I couldn't pay it back. So if people, you know, took the time to read uh, or understand what it is that they were doing, uh, you know, she talks about what we're willing to uh, protect people from a bad toaster but not from a bad mortgage. Well, you know... 
if, if you don't read what you're getting yourself into when you're signing a mortgage, then that's partially your fault, and you should take responsibility for it. And if you did, you wouldn't have to worry. You wouldn't need a Consumer Protection Financial Bureau. So, plus, you know, it's a what a five hundred million dollar bureaucracy under the Fed. Uh, with you know, what else is under the Fed without any oversight from Congress? Or I mean, so I just I don't really understand the, the governance of the CFPB. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I guess in theory it's an okay thing, just more government bureaucracy that we could avoid if people just took responsibility for their own actions. Yeah, and governance alone, I think it was unconstitutional for a while. We were told, too, that what they target is by size, so they can drive fine maximization, not necessarily where the problem is the worst, which also seems a, you know, a reversal of right. Mean, you know, just creating a, another government agency bureaucracy just, you know, cries out for, uh, you know, systemic, uh, example of systemic abuse. Okay, now, so, you know, while, you're, while you talk about, you know, bashing uh, Wall Street has gone overboard, you are, and, and you've actually honed in exactly on where there is a big problem. The firm, uh, the street used to be very partnership culture oriented, and now it's all other people's money. So uh, dive in there. Well, I mean, that is just from you know, firsthand experience that, I mean, uh, having worked at Lazard, which was a private partnership, and now, of course, it has gone public, like the rest of Wall Street. I just think that uh, when uh, uh, Wall Street was a series of private uh, partnerships, uh, basically undercapitalized, where all the money came from the partners, and they had their uh, full net worth on the line every day until they created LLCs and limited it to just the capital they put in the firm. Nevertheless, huge portions of their net worth were tied up uh, in these firms, and so, so therefore they were rewarded for prudent risk-taking and focused on having pre-tax income instead of just generating revenue. Uh, that all was transformed when DLJ went public in 1970, when basically nobody was watching because we were focused on other things in this country, and uh, a changed Wall Street culture forever. So you went from a partnership culture to a bonus culture, when, and when people... Uh, uh, you know, are now completely focused on Wall Street and generating as much revenue as they possibly can so they can march themselves into their boss's office at the end of the year and proclaim how much revenue they generated. Well, so when you, when you focus on revenue generation as opposed to pre-tax profits, uh, you're, 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 you know, creating things like credit default swaps or mortgage-backed securities that are fee-generated uh, uh, issuances and, uh, you know, just you're focused on just getting those things out the door and not the consequences ultimately of, of what happens. And you saw in 2007 and 2008 people were packaging up mortgages that should never have been uh, made and selling them off as securities all around the world, getting fees for those sales and then, you know, getting big bonuses as a result without any taking into account any consequence whatsoever of what happens uh, when, you know, of, of those securities that were issued that should never have been issued in the first place. And it was all driven by people wanting a big bonus, and that is a big, big mistake. And nobody's talking about it. If Elizabeth Warren really cared about Wall Street and fixing Wall Street, that's what she'd be talking about, not, you know, bashing bankers at every turn and somebody who wants to work in Washington and give up their lucrative Wall Street career. But nobody's talking about that. It didn't, nobody is talking about that. What about inside the firms? I mean, the, the firms that have looked at themselves, maybe Goldman Sachs, uh, have they realized, um, you know, why this thing got out of hand and that, you know, these these junk stuff got ended up warehoused on their balance sheet and, and in Merrill's case, broke the bank? You know, so people think Wall Street is monolithic and that all these firms are the same. In fact, they're actually very different. I know that firsthand from working at a bunch of them, but just also, uh, uh, you know, investigating and researching and writing about a bunch of them as well. I mean, uh, you know, Gold Goldman, as, as I alluded to before, and as I wrote in my book about Goldman, uh, had a very different risk culture than other firms. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, some good, some not so good, they became aware of the brewing crisis, yeah. uh, took action against it, and basically was able to make money at, in 2008 from a proprietary bet against the mortgage market that uh, other firms did not see or make, and therefore, like Merrill, lost a lot of money. Uh, so uh, firms have different risk cultures. Uh, some firms are good at it. Some firms are not. Uh, uh, those that are not, uh, by and large, are gone or should be gone. Uh, and, you know, it's a real key asset of a place like Goldman Sachs to have a, a better risk uh, management culture than other firms. But, 
you know, again, you you know, are firms introspective and looking at what they did wrong? Uh, no, not really. They're very, you know, they're just sort of moving on and, and getting on with it. And I think that real leadership on Wall Street would uh, talk about uh, changing the compensation system so this kind of thing never happens again. 30 seconds. Um, is it basically your message is you can't legislate human behavior, right? Of course. I mean, there have been financial crises even before there was a Wall Street. Uh, you know, you have to just reward people to do what you want them to do. People are pretty simple. They do what they're rewarded to do. And on Wall Street, they are still rewarded to take risks with other people's money. And if you want to change Wall Street, you have to change that. Listen to Business Talk with Jim Campbell from our flagship stations here, Radio, WYBC, and WGCH, Greenwich. Our final segment will look about moving forward. And we're back with our final segment with Bill Cohn. He's an off-time critic of Wall Street, but he's telling us why we need Wall Street uh, today. I want to just explore how uh, changing the, to a um, more accountable uh, partnership-like compensation uh, structure and um, how do you see uh, implementing that? What you don't you don't think the firm should should take themselves private? How many people should be involved? Would there be clawbacks? How do you see it actually being implemented? It requires leadership from the top of Wall Street, so it would have to be you know uh, Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon, you know, sort of mm-hmm. raising their hand and saying this is something we need to do. That's number one. Uh, you're right. You're not going to take Goldman Sachs private. There's not enough capital uh, in the world at the moment to support a buyout of Goldman Sachs, and then you'd lard it up with all this debt. It would be ridiculous. So that's not going to happen. So my uh, idea is to require the top, say, 500 people at each of these firms, the people who make the decisions about who to hire and fire and how much they should get paid, what business lines to be in, how to to allocate capital, uh, you know, the, 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 the machers at the top of these firms, uh, to once again have their full net worth on the line again, and by doing by and how to do that, and so I don't know. I know there's you know there's plenty of thousand dollar an hour Wall Street lawyers who could help uh, design uh, a program to do this. But the basic idea is to give creditors and shareholders a, a first lien on the assets of these 500 uh, people who, who run the bank in case. You know, something goes wrong in the case of a, uh, a liquidation or a bankruptcy or a credit default, they would be able to make a claim against the full net worth of the top 500 people at these firms and uh, you know, go after their assets, their homes, their bank accounts, their art collections, their cars, whatever it is. Now, wow. I know people will you know, roll their eyes and, and think that's absolutely ridiculous, but that's exactly the way Wall Street used to work. For the first three quarters of Wall Street's existence, for the first 150 years until 1970, that's what most banks, exactly how most banks operated. So it's not a foreign idea. It's in their DNA. Uh, and the problem is that when you take that away, uh, people take their eye off the ball. They, they think they make you know, a lot of money they, and, and they don't uh, uh, you know, have to worry about such things. You know, when I... Uh, wrote House of Cards of, about Bear Stearns. I spoke to Jimmy Kane, who had lost a billion dollars in the stock of of Bear Stearns, and you would have thought that that would have devastated him and motivated him, you know, because he had so much on the line to you know pay attention to what was going on at Bear Stearns. And so I asked him about that, and I I was really kind of interested and excited to hear his answer. To, My God, I'm talking to somebody who's lost a billion dollars in their own stock. And instead of saying that he was devastated, he said, actually, it didn't affect him that much. It just really affected his heirs more than him. And, of course, he's still alive, so it hasn't affected his heirs yet. And the reason is it's because he had already taken out 400 or $600 million and turned it into cash and turned it into homes and bank accounts and all these other things. So even though he lost a billion dollars, he still had $400 million lying around. And guess what? That doesn't affect his lifestyle. $400, $400 $400, $400 million is plenty. Now, if he'd had the billion four on the line, or the billion six, as he told me, uh, then that would have made a big difference. So he might have focused. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that um, what you're calling for is actually a lot tougher than anything Elizabeth Warren is calling for. Well, that's because I understand exactly what motivates people on Wall Street. Yeah. I mean, if you did this, you could junk Dodd-Frank, you could junk the Volcker, you wouldn't need a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act. You could stop vilifying Wall Street. Uh, you could get Wall Street back to doing what it does best, which is provide capital to people who need it and want it to grow their businesses. Instead of vilifying Wall Street, you know, this would make everybody who works on Wall Street, the leaders of Wall Street, very focused on, on how Wall Street functions and works, 
best and would not take imprudent risks. Let me ask you this. You'll get people will say right off the bat, oh, well, the investment bankers will quit. They're not going to put up with that. Uh, you don't buy that, right? I don't buy that because, look, investment bankers are uh, uh, the most risk-averse people in, in, in the world. Where else can you go to work and putting up none of your own capital, zero, <laughs> and getting paid millions of dollars a year in, in, in bonuses and, and uh, if, you're, if you're good at what you do? There's no other place in the world you can do that. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you're in a hedge fund or a private equity fund or, or or starting a company, you've got your own capital on the line. If you work at Goldman Sachs, you basically have none of your own money on the line, and you're expecting to get millions of dollars in compensation. Well, guess what? That means you're a collection of risk-averse people. Yes, some people will decide, I'm not going. This is not for me. But what if you go to a hedge fund or a private equity fund? Uh, you're going to have some of your own capital on the line. So you know, you can't be naive about these things. You know, and besides, at some point, it has to be about more than just uh, how, how you can just game the system. Some, at some point, you have to you know, do the right thing Good point. For, for the American people. You have another pretty creative or different idea, which is the DOJ should regulate, uh, the Department of Justice should regulate Wall Street, not the Fed. Well, I mean, what, what, what I, uh, my point there is that the, the DOJ should hold Wall Street accountable for wrongdoing, and in this case, after 2008, failed to do that, into that vacuum, because nature abhors a vacuum, into that vacuum where no one was held accountable, uh, the regulators stepped in to try to hold Wall Street capital, uh, accountable, and as we were talking about before, turn them into utilities when that's, you know, th- that penalizes, ends up penalizing the American economy, as Larry as Summers has talked about, secular stagnation, you know, condemning us to mm. 2% growth, because you know, the engine of the American economy, Wall Street, is gummed up with all this sand from regulators who are trying to, you know, slow it down and turn it into utilities. Well, if the Justice Department had done its job by holding people accountable for the wrongdoing they had done, instead of abdicating on that, you wouldn't have regulators and politicians jumping into that vacuum to try to make sure that Wall Street never causes another financial crisis, which is ridiculous. That's against human nature, and that's not what we want Wall Street to do. Uh, we're down to the last minute. Do you? Um, w- what do you think is going to come out of Trump populism? Do you think eventually um, that th- there won't be that much change on the street? Well, I, I think you know. Again, he's telegraphed that he intends to uh, you know blow up Dodd Frank uh, and the Volcker Rule and and you know get get the economy going again by unleashing the animal spirits of Wall Street, which basically, in theory, I think is a good thing. But we're at a moment where we need a scalpel. Because uh, to, to some of these rules and regulations, because some of them are quite useful, like requiring uh, higher capital requirements, mm-hmm. uh, uh, requiring derivatives to be tra- traded on exchange, uh, not allowing as much leverage into the system. Some of that is very useful, and unfortunately, Donald Trump is kind of a sledgehammer kind of a guy, and not a scalpel kind of a guy. So I'm, I'm not uh, optimistic that he's going to do the right thing. And I'm sure you would say that this uh, movement to change compensation ought to be going on concomitantly with any. That should be part of the grand bargain exactly, that Wall exactly. Street, that Trump and Wall Street engage in. Fascinating uh, insights, Bill. Um, taking on uh, the culture of Wall Street while protecting the overall mission of uh, really getting our economy growing again. We need Wall Street working well. Thanks to William D. Cohen. The book is Why Wall Street Matters, another seminal book from Bill. Next week, we're going to look into a Wall Street scandal, London style, the LIBOR scandal, uh, told in detective story fashion by the Wall Street Journal reporter David Enrich. Thanks to Bill Cohen for coming back once again. He's always welcome. Thanks to our national audience for listening, and we'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.